Hello. Hey. Oh, it's been a long day. How is everyone doing? Good. Good. I'm doing okay, but I have to do true confessions. I didn't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> but I see you're recording, so maybe I'll be able to read it and then watch this again. <laughs> definitely. That That is definitely... <laughs> Um, a possibility. Thank you. I'm glad um, you're doing that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I haven't had a chance to look. I'm doing this national conference next week, um, and we've been meeting every day for hours and hours and hours. It seems like, and I still have regular work and a church to pastor, so it's like I don't know whether I'm going or coming. So I don't know how many people signed up, but. Um, I am super, super, super excited that, as they used to say in the country, God willing and the creek don't rise. Don't rise. The author is supposed to join us at 7.15 um, for the rest how, of- How do you swing that? So, <laughs> yeah, it's a true story. It's, it's the funniest thing ever. So, you know, I do these online. Um, and I had reached out to authors in the past, but the the last one that I wanted, he wanted two thousand dollars, and I was like, "Oh, we're just not that that type, right?" So this author found it online and sent me an email saying, "Oh my goodness, you know, thank you for picking my book. Um, I'm interested to see, you know, how a group like this receives it." and good luck with the discussion. So I decided, you know what? It never hurts to ask. So <laughs> I said, hey, I've read this book a million times and the whole series and several of your other books. And it's a really cool group that we get together. And I know you're busy. So even if you can just pop on just to, you know, say, hey, that would be really awesome. But if you can stay or, you know, and I also realize it's been a long time since you've read the book. So I don't want to like, you know, we just read it and it was published, you know, 16 years ago or 15 years ago. So I didn't want to like, you know, put you on the spot or anything. And he was a super nice. And we went back and forth and he <clears throat> said that they are hosting a child from the ukraine oh right which is awesome so he was a little hesitant to commit uh, he's like you know something might pop up because i think the, the child just got there recently mm. so like even if you know if you can great if you can stay great if you can't great you know just and he was super gracious and was like i can get on at 7 15 that gives them 15 minutes to say anything negative before I'm in the room. <laughs> so, so yeah. So God willing in the That's awesome. Prize. Yeah. I think it I think it's awesome. So the so that gave me a boldness to ask Madam CJ Walker's great great granddaughter who wrote next month's book. And that looks promising too, actually. <laughs> so yeah, it just it is never no. Um so before he gets on, but um, did everyone, but I know Mary, you said you, full disclosure, you didn't get a chance to read the book, but the discussion will benefit you. It's, I don't think there was any, you know, uh, yeah, this sport, this, you're going to be spoiled, but I still think you'll get a lot out of, out of reading it. Um, so did everyone else get a chance to read it or at least, you know, most of it? Yes. I'm a few I'm a few pages short. I ended with a miniature golf event. Okay. Oh, good <laughs> story. I really hated that professor. Yeah. He's obnoxious. I've known them. I I, I know them. I <laughs> I definitely have some of those. Okay, so so cool. Um yeah, I'm super, super, super excited to share it. So before he gets on, does anyone have any uh, anything negative to say? Not that you won't say it with with the with the author on, but I just thought that was a funny 
I thought we should at least try. Yes, Lynette. I, I didn't like the way that it ended. <laughs> I, I, just, I thought it fell flat. Mm. I loved everything right up until like, okay, she's pregnant and then I, I eh. oops, sorry, Alan. Sorry, Mary. Okay, I just, <laughs> we'll, we'll read the rest of it. That's all. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here for the spiritual experience. Believe me, I get, you know, I, I'll forget everything and two shakes on my scale. I don't care if you blow the ending. It'll be so much fun for me to read it since I already kind of know the ending. I, you know, I read The Shack and watched that movie probably five times. You know, I, I read things over and over. So no, I like no The problem. Shack too. Yeah, The Shack um, is fabulous. It's so funny you say that, Lynette, because this time, you know, I've read this book a bazillion times and I've listened to it. The first time I encountered it, I actually listened to it because I, I was driving from Cincinnati to New York, I think. And I was, I looked for like road trip books, like audio books. And as you might imagine, this was a pretty, this is one on the list. And so, so I listened to it, but this time, having read it several times and read lunch with Buddha and dinner with Buddha, it all like, the, like there was a lot of foreshadowing for lunch with Buddha and dinner with Buddha, including um, the ending. And, and so, that's kind of what it felt like. It's like, Oh, no, stay tuned for the next book. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and so knowing what happens, like there are certain parts in the book that I'm like, oh, this is why, you know, like he's going to put it in. Exactly. What he didn't find out. Well, he 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 thought that, that they were together kind of ish when he first saw them. But um, so yeah, that that that's definitely true. Anyone, anything else? Meg? Well, there's a little section where um he says that uh, people with an easy life have a, um, a more possibility of achieving greater spiritual growth in this life. Uh, and I thought that was not true and, and, and also very uh, not Buddhist. That, that it's just, that's something that um, middle class and upper middle class people will sometimes say, well, we have the leisure to, to meditate and that we're not worried about where the next meal is coming from. But Buddhism ha has had, um, very uh, prominent leaders who came from very poor backgrounds. And it's just not, uh, yeah, I, I think there, there's a, a, a kind of arrogance that goes with um, some kind of new age thinking that says, well, uh, you know, um, middle class, upper middle class white people in Western civilization have better opportunity for a higher level of consciousness, which I think is flat out racist. Mm. I don't yeah, it's like progressive that. over the top and it doesn't account for the resilience associated with trauma. That is really a great insight. See, I knew I was supposed to be on here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just not true. I mean, Buddhism, one of the things that was interesting about Buddhism coming into India was that it, um, it didn't buy into the caste system as far as spiritual growth was concerned. It undercut it. So Buddhism doesn't teach that only Brahmins can reach enlightenment. <laughs> It teaches that everybody can reach enlightenment, uh, and that the, the key thing is is I mean the rest of the book is is accurate. The key, key thing is is really um, uh, following the, the ethical precepts. Are are you a generous person? So the poor people who give money to the monks who otherwise don't get anything to eat, they they're the ones who get the most merit. It's like uh, the parable, you know, if you give the person who doesn't have very much, who gives everything they have, it is more spiritually advanced. Um, it's that same kind of insight that Buddhism has always had. Um, so I, I just think it's a little blind spot in the book. And I, I'm curious if it's fixed later or not. I mean, and, and you can see he does put, you know, diverse folks in the group, including economically diverse, but I'm not convinced by that. Who do you remember who said it? Was it the main character or was it the. Oh, it, it was the it was the monk. I mean, I, I consider him a monk. Um, it was. He's wearing monk's robes. Right. right. <laughs> uh, Interesting. And it's, I, when I yeah. shared this book, I have a group of clergy leaders that we read books and share articles and 
we're all over the country. We're all black, but we're all over the country in different size churches. And some people don't pastor and some people don't pastor anymore. And some people are just, you know, but, but we're, we've all dedicated to this, this group. And when we read it, it was so interesting because one of my friends said, he was like, I read the book halfway through and then I had to stop and change how I was reading it and mm -hmm. start from the beginning. And I said, what do you mean? He said, because I was reading it as a spiritual text mm. that I was reading it to look for, you know, like, you know, these people were saying these things and I'm trying to understand these concepts and how these fit into my beliefs and other beliefs and whether I agree with them or not. And he's like, I'm, I'm reading it as, you know, this is a monk teaching and I should be paying attention to what he's saying. And he was like, and there was a such problems I had with certain <laughs> parts of it. He said, but when I stopped and just like, this is a freaking, he didn't say freaking, another word, novel. <laughs> and he said, what if I just, you know, read it as a story? And it was so interesting because then we we had really interesting dialogue um, based on, oh, okay, how, because like in the UCC, we believe that God is still speaking. So there's there's opportunities for for new stuff and novels and articles, even textbooks. Sometimes I'll read a textbook. I'm like, oh my God, I needed this uh, <laughs> in my life. And it like for God to speak in these ways. Um, but it's also interesting to, to, to look at texts like, you know, anything as, as someone's experience or someone's thing that, that I can agree with, disagree with, glean from, get not get like don't like i just thought that was i thought that went along with what you were saying meg like like how we looked um how we looked at it awesome anything else um i will say that the only thing that kind of rang untrue for me is the um auto he kind of he said that a meditation that he, you know, that he did meditate to where he, like, length, and I mean, if this guy was, I mean, he was on the, he was on the very beginning of his journey, and for him to experience, you know, nothingness or whatever it's called, um, that early, that soon in his journey, um, uh, I, I thought, I thought that one was, yeah, I'm curious to ask him about that because his first meditation session is two hours long and the only instruction he gets is to think about nothing. And that is a setup. Most of us would run screaming from the room yeah. well, mentally, if not literally, in yeah. about 15 minutes. With those instructions, it, we, wouldn't, we just wouldn't get anything. I, I didn't get anything from it when I was told, given those instructions. And I certainly couldn't have sat for two hours. Yeah. So, but but some people do. I I mean, I'm gonna. I think that's a good one to ask him. Is that his experience, or is that something he would change now? That's that's. I think I told Meg when I went. I went to a conference, a climate change conference at <laughs> yeah. Union Theological Seminary in um, New York, and it was an amazing conference. And I had just found meditation maybe a year or two before that but it started literally in two minute increments right <laughs> it was like you know and, and, <laughs> right just breathe and see the words float away you know because stuff is going to pop up and we had a session for one hour before the conference got started the like for the first full day of the conference got started in a big room with fold up chairs um and it was, I was going to say, was it guided? The first five minutes, I think, were guided. And it was an hour. And I, who was not diagnosed with sleep apnea at that time, <laughs> eventually was. And I, I fell asleep. And then I would feel terrible for falling asleep and snoring. This is another part of sleep apnea. And I wasn't the only one, right? And I was like, God, I I felt bad that there was something wrong that I'm not able to sit here 
in these uncomfortable chairs for one hour. And then eventually I realized this is really not the way um, you 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 do that. Like that's that's pretty advanced meditation work to so yeah, I I and I think in his set, I think he got something maybe the last couple of minutes or so, but I I thought I would have fell asleep or you know, grocery shopped in my head or um or all that kind of thing. I would have painted the room and <laughs> scrubbed the floors and, and uh, detailed the car. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's go ahead and get started. Hopefully he joins us, but we'll go ahead and get started as we normally would with everyone just giving us a word or a phrase um, when you think about the book. And um, I'll start while everyone's thinking of their word. And I'll say for this word, this is a word I'll never use in another book probably. I'll say delicious. I really like the food descriptions. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I I really enjoyed the food descriptions i really enjoyed and and i also think since reading this book i changed the way i road trip like i used to focus on getting there really quickly so you know now i do try to find food and things to do and and things to see so i'll put that out there uh meg gonna give us a word my word is family Mm. Uh, because um, uh, uh, there was this lovely quote about um, um, uh, the people you really love, the spirits that are close to your spirit, they tie right around you life after life. They just keep coming back. And uh, I, I thought the whole book was about um, uh who, who we love and how we love them and uh so I'm, I'm gonna stick with family that's a good one that that is that's a that's a really good one um alan i i think um i don't have a word but the the uh, what struck me about the the book as far as i've read it it is uh uh a lot of it is about the the bumping into one another in relationships where we're not certain about uh, whether we are comfortable with someone else or not and how much we learn and gain from those kinds of experiences. Mm, I love that. Uh, Elizabeth? I loved it. Um, it's my new favorite fiction book. I can't believe I've never read it before, but yeah, I I read it or I loved it. So. I'll leave it there. I'll I'll save my views until until he gets on here because I'm sure he's gonna love to hear. Love, 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 <laughs> uh, Lynette. Um, the first word that came to mind was fun. It was a fun book. Um, I enjoyed the interaction. Um, the, the, but the, for, for me, the, the key part is like, um, similar to what Alan was saying, you, you, you never know who's going to influence you. Is there a word for that? <laughs> <laughs> One word. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Serendipity. That's, <laughs> that's the word I was thinking. Yeah, serendipity. That, that's close. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say maybe there's not a word, but yeah, I, I completely agree. And even how I discovered the book was kind of like that. I had a coupon and it was on the list for $5 audiobooks. And if you buy audiobooks, that's a pretty good price. And so I saw Buddha and thought, ah, I can swing this. Uh, sh is it Cherie or Sherry? It's Sherry. Sherry, well, thank um, you for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Um, I Expansive. Because it, mm. it was interesting to see his the journey of thought 
and just the perspective of seeing the people around him differently and how his, like the beginning, he, the food descriptions um, don't resonate so much with me because I can't eat gluten. So when people talk mm. about that stuff, it's just like, I, you know, well, that's not for me. So I don't think about it, but he went from being very, very focused on it to like less and less focused. And so his like entire perspective of looking at the world around him evolved in that about a week. Oh, that's very true. I never even think about that. Mm -hmm. That that that's a good one. Thank, Thank you, you. <laughs> uh, Joyce. Um. Yeah, I just joined the group, so I didn't hear the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, one word uh, to describe the book. And if you can't come up with the word, you know, just something that the book made you think about or something that resonated with you in relation to the book. I guess the one word that would come to my mind was love because it seemed like the deeper they got into the journey and the deeper he got into his internal life and listening was the concept of every Every person you come into contact with, you make a decision. And to me, the book seemed so relevant for mm. current times, or maybe it's always been relevant, but um, love is the word that comes to mind. Okay, awesome. So he's trying to get in and struggling. Hold on one second. I'm going to... Get him the link again. Oh. The initial link that I had um, through Eventbrite was um, for some reason invalid. I had to right. re-register you too. Okay. I got the I got in through the link on the Facebook page. Ah. Rather than the Eventbrite email gave me oh, a zoom man. link that didn't work mm -hmm. yeah oh man let's see here the facebook page yeah, yeah. You came in through event right so but so that worked for me but i didn't know there was a facebook page where we can come in That's well great. on the facebook um reverend derrick's um book Face club book, group yeah, yeah. it Has showed been. that i had a ticket through Eventbrite. And then it just had a button, enter meeting. And I clicked that and got in. That would have been nice. Yeah, because I thought that, I thought Reverend probably had us registering again so that we didn't get any like um, uh, folks that, you know, weren't, weren't supposed to be part of the group. Like um, trolls, I guess they're called or whatever those, whatever those people are that if you say something on Facebook or something like that, uh, you know, start acting crazy. Oh man, that's so that on Zoom crazy. Too. Oh, wait, somebody's in the waiting room. Oh, he's in here. Yay! And Dixie. So the whole time I'm looking, they're probably up there and I didn't see it. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's see. Thank you. I'm so sorry about that. There were some people having trouble with the link and um, looks like you're able to get in. There we go. All right. I'm super, 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 super excited uh, that we have um, Dixie, of course. I'm also super excited that Mr. Roland Murillo, did I say that correctly? Pretty good, yeah, pretty good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So welcome, 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 and thank you for joining us. <laughs> nice to be here. My daughter figured out how to work around the link, which didn't work. Yeah, I apologize for that. Um, no I don't know what was going on there, but I we will... Oh. but I'm late because I just tested positive for COVID. Oh. So That's I was just test. Well, I hope you feel better soon. I hope so too. 
Yeah, let me know if you need anything. That that's no fun. Yeah, I called urgent care because my doctor's closed and they said I have to call my doctor because I'm on too many medications for them to prescribe Paxlovid for me. So I can't call until tomorrow. It's too bad. Yeah, absolutely. Well, keep you in prayer, Dixie. Thank you. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So, um, this is our first time ever having the actual author of a book online. It's a pretty big deal for our little, look how far we've come, baby. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so usually we have everyone who goes through to give us one word about the book. We talked a little bit about the book. I gave everyone the, the uh, message that you would join us a little later so they could say any bad things before you got on. So we've got that out of the way. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. I just want to say you can say anything. I'm not, I'm not sensitive in the slightest. Don't worry about that. Real. I'd appreciate honesty more than anything. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so since we since we have you on, one, thank you. Two, I just want to share a little bit about our book club and and how we came to be and what we do. Um, so we started. <laughs> 2020 during the pandemic well during the quarantine period of the pandemic because i like to read and i wanted to introduce people to books that they may not ordinarily uh have a chance to to experience and i think also we needed community and so um, we started and we just won't give up on it this is one of the funnest books we've ever looked at Every now and then the books get kind of heavy. Uh, you know, we're reading about slavery and oppression and some important stuff, but they they can they can get really heavy. And I think the last one that we read was James Baldwin Go Telling on the Mountain. Yeah. And um, we read some Tony Morrison and and so you know it, it it got a little heavy. And so this was our fun summer book because I discovered this book years ago when I took a road trip from Cincinnati driving to New York and it was interesting because I was I was going through Pennsylvania and some of the other places to hear the book I listened to the audiobook at that time talk about some of those places I actually stopped at the Hershey factory because of this book <laughs> so uh just want to say thank you so much and if you wouldn't mind is introducing yourself and telling us uh, anything that you would like for us to know and, and welcome. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm just an ordinary guy, I live in the woods of Massachusetts. I have a wife and two mostly grown daughters, 21 and 24. I was a carpenter for a long time. I have a Boston accent, so I might say that differently than some people. <laughs> um, I worked overseas for a while. I was writing from the time I was 25. And um, this book came up. I can tell you how this came, if you want it, and pretty briefly. I, I love golf. It's my midlife passion. I played other sports when I was younger and can't do them now. So all that athletic energy went into golf. And I wrote a book called Golf with God that was published by Algonquin. And Algonquin called, the editor called me up and said, we did well with Golf with God. I would like you to write another book like that, not golf related, but he called it quirky spiritual. That was good. <laughs> so, you know, I was on the phone with him and he was asking me to write another book and I had a wife and two kids to support. And he said, do you have any idea, any ideas? And, and I really didn't, but I had <laughs> to think, I had to think really fast. And I said, I've been to 45 states. I've never been to North Dakota. <laughs> I had this idea that it's somehow spiritual, empty, beautiful, evocative. And I love to drive. And I, I think I could drive to North Dakota and write a good book. And there was a very long pause on the other end of the line. <laughs> and he said, can you be more specific? And I said, <laughs> not really. And they... <laughs> 
I like to say they gave me an advance commensurate with their enthusiasm for that. <laughs> Not very enthusiastic, but I took the first half of the road trip by myself. From My agent lived in Bronxville. I drove down to Bronxville, spent some time walking around with her, um, and then just headed west and got lost, which I tend to do. And I and I got to Chicago, and I was uh, trying to do stuff that I wouldn't ordinarily do, like go to the Hershey's factory, and taking notes and writing little bits of dialogue. And then I flew home from Chicago, wrote up about the first hundred pages or so, and then waited for my kids to get out of school. They were, I think, they were like in nine and six, and then we flew back to Chicago, rented a van, and just drove without any any plan we knew we wanted to go to north dakota but other than that we just went like we went where we felt like going and um never made a, a lodging more than a day in advance and um came home and wrote the book it didn't do particularly well the first year in hardcover and then it got into the book club circuit and it just keeps going and going and going that was um 15 years ago and it still it still sells it sold altogether over a quarter million copies and it still sells you know five thousand or more a year which for a 15 year old book is a lot and it's been translated into i don't know 10 languages so it's been a a good piece of good fortune for me <laughs> snap snap snaps that's awesome that the 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 fact that you just decided I'm just going to drive to North Dakota. Yeah. Um, Can you be more specific? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Can nope. I ask? So, do you do you have any spiritual background? Like, uh, how do you define how do you define spiritual background? Like, did you take yoga? Did you take yoga classes or yoga philosophy and? Um, I mean, yeah, like, like I, I will say I love this book. This is my new favorite fiction book. Um, and when I read it, I, I have a tendency to not remember the names of books I read, and or the off names of the author. And so I, I just, um, I and I got it on audio. It was an audio, and um. And so I just listened to it and it, it re it starts off like a memoir. Right. And so I was thinking it's a memoir. I was thinking it was a true story. And I, and, but then when I would stop listening and then of course, when I would start listening again, there would come up the cover with, with your name, you know, Roland at, Rulo at the bottom. And I was like, well, that's not the, the guy's name, <laughs> the name, <laughs> name, but I was, it's like when you're, when you're about to, when, when you kind of figure out Santa Claus and you're trying, you're trying to not realize that that's the true thing. That's what it felt like to me. I was like, okay, I'm denying that this is a, this is a fiction because I loved it so much and the true story. Nobody ever said that to me. That's the first time I've ever heard that. That's good. I like that. <laughs> and um, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Sure. So and, and like um, when he when you described that he um, the auto got angry, like he not at other people, but it just at things like traffic jams. I used to be that that way as well, but yeah. um. You know, I I've uh, I started yoga philosophy about what about seven years ago, and yeah, and I've changed. And so I was just wondering how I, I thought you were like a big yogi. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did do yoga for a few years. I I grew up devout Roman Catholic uh, for twenty five years and and no longer practice that faith. But I don't know if you've ever heard of Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was a Catholic monk uh, who became interested in the religions of the East, wrote a book with D.T. Suzuki, who's a famous Zen master and practiced Zen meditation himself. 
And he kind of gave Catholics like me permission to look into those ideas. And so I, I have been doing that for 30 or 40 years and reading and I've gone on some retreats, uh, not a lot since the kids were born, but um, I have a meditation practice that I've had for 40 years. I, I did do yoga fairly intensively. I have some back problems um, that have kept me away from it, but I want to get back into it. I thought it was great. And um, I kind of mix um, the Christian background and the, and the Eastern religion uh, material that I've studied for my own personal path, if you will. My own spiritual life is a mixture of those things. Okay. But I have no credentials whatsoever. I'm not ordained. I never took a religion class in college. You know, I went to I went to mass every Sunday for 24 years, but that's about it. Okay. That was one of my questions: is what was your spiritual background? Um, because yeah, I mean, of course, you. It's obvious that you have a pretty extensive one um, in the book. So yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, I've never had the author in. It's like usually we get to like, what do you think the author meant by this? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say again, don't hold back because I, it, in my business, if you look on Amazon on any of my 25 books, you know, you'll see five stars, best book I ever read, changed my life. And the next one will be one star, waste of money, hated it. <laughs> and so after a while, I've heard everything. And if someone doesn't like something or doesn't found something not well explained or described, that's okay. I don't mind hearing that. Good. And that's exactly what I was going to say. If there was any uh, anyone who wants to ask or or say more, we have a pretty good mix on the line. Meg? I'm just going to be selfish and ask you about uh, what the part of the book that I liked the best was this little um, piece on um, family and how the people that we um, love uh, and are tied to in life come back again and again and that we're tied to them. Um, and, uh, you know, to be personal, I've, I've just had some, some deaths in my family and, um, my, my son was adopted. So there's already this, um, you know, kind of spiritual dimension to how, how did this family get formed? Right. Like right. how did he get to be mine out of, out of the universe? Right. But he was so clearly ours and he felt we were his. And, um, I, I just wonder if you could say a little more about that idea and and what it means to you personally and what it meant in the book the first thing i would say is that i don't know i don't pretend to know you know like everyone else i have my ideas about but it seems to me that it would be very strange for a god or a divine intelligence is the words that the buddhists use to put you together so intimately with people over the course of a lifetime and then snuff that out when the person dies. I, I, I'm sure it's possible. It may work that way. We'll find out. But it seems a little, just doesn't make sense. I guess I want God to be sensible, logical at some level. I, there are always going to be things the human brain can't grasp. Why is there evil on earth, for example? But the big picture, I, I, I hope God is sensible, logical, rational, loving, and so on. And why a, a, a divine spirit would put you and your son together in this lifetime to form this incredibly intense, loving relationship, and then poof, that's the end of it, doesn't work for me. I, so I guess it's wishful thinking that and we've all had, you know, I lost my father. I was very close to him. I lost him at a fairly young age. And you feel a connection with that person. I don't think we are our bodies. I don't think, I think the body is a vehicle. It's pretty, I think any spiritual tradition will say that. And so when you, when someone dies, that you lose their body, you lose the connection with their body, but do you, lose their connection with their spirit 
I like to think that we don't. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that touches me in a tearful way almost. <laughs> that was but I, I love that. Like um I follow uh, Yoruba is a cultural, it's not really a religion, it's more of a way of life and a culture, West African. Um, and that's the it it's the idea that when someone dies, their spirit is still with and in and among us and advocating to God on our behalf. And and that's not just this generation, it's even generations even before we were born, who are, you know, this cloud of witness to all these people, all these spirits, all these energies. And whenever I think of that, it just um it just makes me feel really good. Um, so I do. The idea of angels, where did that come from? That's been around for thousands of years. And maybe it's just wishful thinking, but maybe it isn't. You know, maybe there are people who go to another dimension and they look out for you and then you look out for them or you look out for someone. I don't know, but, but it, I guess that makes more sense to me than the idea that you're just randomly put together with somebody out of the 7 billion, you know, doesn't make sense to me. Absolutely. Anyone have anything else before Joyce? Up, oh, you're on mute, Joyce. Okay, sorry. Um, there were two parts that really struck me. One was the description about people who were more scarred and had armor and the armor was the cigarettes and drinking and tough guy and that kind of thing. I thought that was just such a good description, partly because I think I could see myself so well in the in the auto character, like like turning on AM radio, which I know is going to upset me, and then being mad about it, you know? I could just see so many characteristics that he had because in me, because I think the themes were so universal. Yeah. You know, is this all there is to life, and how do I handle all this coming at me, you know? So I, I read the book, and I finished it today, and um, I think I'm going to go back and reread it because those themes are so universal and the advice given is so thought provoking. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, I think one way to look at the book is Otto is a good person. I mean, he's a good human being. He's a good father. He's a good husband. He does volunteer work. He's generous. He doesn't really do anything. And Rinpoche is trying to say to him, that's the beginning, not the end. Mm. That's the foundation of your spiritual life. That's not the capstone that, you know, and then where do you go from there? He's trying to show him there are, there is more to the spiritual life than just being a good guy. It's, it's good to be good, it's, but Rinpoche is trying to push him a little bit. There's something... Oh, I'm sorry, does someone have any? Oh, I, go ahead, Lynette. Um, I, the, I have used the phrase, why so angry? So much since I've read the book. <laughs> you know? And it, it's so, um, so poignant for, for these times that, that we're in. You, you know, it's like everybody seems so the angry. Yeah. Um, uh, but I have a, a question. Um, okay. the, char the character that was the professor at the um, the putt putt golf yeah. um, is that based on somebody that you knew? Because I I could I could just see several professors that I have had <laughs> in that character. No, he's not based on any particular individual. But I did teach in college for about ten years and. I have a lot of good friends who are academics, but it seems to me that there's a way that some academics worship their own thought process. Yeah. They're, they're obviously big brain, they're highly intelligent. And it makes me think of 
um, false gods, worshiping false gods, it seems to me they worship their own mental, pro like they say, well, there can't be life after, there can't be any other life after death, obviously there can't be God because there's evil in the world. Well, that's not very humble to me. You know, maybe you just don't, maybe we just don't understand why there's evil in the world. Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, but don't say it like you know that you know you know everything and be cynical about everyone else's explanation because you don't know any better than they do and i and i have some highly intelligent acquaintances and former co-workers who form the basis for that particular he's a you know he's a cliched character but he but there are people who like that and so i wanted to give them a moment in the book and contrast them with uh, Rinpoche's way of being in the world. I love when he said, kindness is one language I know. You know, they asked him how many, he could speak 11 languages and the professor, you know, you know, what are they? He starts naming off stuff and he's like, well, kindness is one. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> exactly, he's, he's throwing a, a little gentle punch with that line. Exactly. And the, and the why so angry, um, all, first of all, everything that happens in the book in terms of the physical surroundings, the meals, the roots, the signs, the things that I saw is all true. I didn't make any of that up. I made up the conversations, but I didn't make up anything else. And so at one point I turned on AM radio and I got a, a famous talk show that no longer exists. And it just, it was like anger coming out of the radio. And so that phrase came to me. And I have to say, we, we've been to Italy a lot in Europe. I like to go to Europe and we just came back from a trip there. And the first thing I noticed when I got back on American soil was how angry people are. And, you know, we have had our problems and that's obvious, but we're also the richest country that's in human history. And many people have extremely comfortable lives if you compare us to the rest of the world. And yet we do seem a, a pretty angry culture. I don't understand why that is. Mm. I think that's a really good segue to a lens that I always like to look at our books through, and that's race, class, and and the like. And yeah. so how Mr. Morello even ended up here is he responded to the event like, I don't know how you're going to talk about critical race theory with this book, but I hope it goes well. Yeah. And so part of the work that I do in my ministry and in life is I'm always looking for how does this, you know, fill in the blank book, song, movie, word speak to um, people on the margins, right? The, the fringes of society. So of course, I'm always looking at Black, LGBTQ, uh, poor, and I saw a lot um, in this book. I went on the trip to Youngstown, just, and, and, and so, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty imaginative. So when I see Youngstown, I think of course, like, you know, of the big Midwest towns, I was recently in Detroit um, and saw entire neighborhoods, mostly black people, that maybe one house is occupied on the whole block in these beautiful old, homes and I'm like God can you imagine living in that one house surrounded by empty houses and and and, and what that looks like but then also how um his sister Cease so is her name Spanakopita is that her name or is that just what she... he calls her because she's flaky I thought so because <laughs> she's so flaky like the Spanakopita crust right but like her I know so many who are the black or brown version of her really oh wow. um, yeah like just really good decent people but because they don't have the the education or the house or the car people well 
Well, two things. One, because they don't have the house, the car, that that kind of thing. They find themselves uh, leaning on spiritual things in a way that some of my friends who have more don't. Yeah. Right. And because they lean on the spiritual side in that way, my friends who have more think that they are somehow uh less than they would never say they would never say that they are less than but that that somehow they are missing something because they, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so i just i i i saw all of those things and and i really loved that they were there and i love even in auto being this amazing decent person that he's aware of his privilege and his class at times, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like it's stamped on me. I'm in this neighborhood and I'm standing out and yeah. So did anyone, I mean, oh, go ahead. No, no, I, I can, I can be quiet for a while and listen to what other people say. I have uh, a lot was, to say about that, but I'll wait. Oh, I think we want to hear what you have to say and then we can see what everybody else has to say. Um, First of all, I, I probably, I probably, I, I look through, I look at, at the country more through the lens of class than race because of my own experience coming from lower middle class and going to the Ivy League. I have two degrees from the Ivy League and I hang around with, you know, all kinds of people. But what I try to do and what I, what I hope Rinpoche tries to do is look beyond that. I'm not, I don't want to diminish the importance of race or gender or sexuality or class. That's very important, but it's not the essence of a human being in my, in my estimation, it's not. And we put a tremendous amount of emphasis on that to try to solve social problems, which is okay. I don't think that's bad. I think it's well meant. But if we focused on looking at people's essence, you tell me if I'm wrong. I read Martin Luther King. I think that's what he did. I, I obviously he was he was um, working mainly for African Americans to have a better life in America. That's obvious. But if you really read his speeches, he talks about poor white people all the time. He talks about people on the margins all the time. And the sad thing to me in America is that there's a tremendous overlap in the lives of poor white people and poor black people. There are many, the percentage of people of color who are poor is much higher. There's no question about that. But if you look at the way some of my relatives live who are poor and some of, some of the poorest black people in America live, there's a lot, there's more similarity than difference. And we, we divide those two groups, which should be natural allies. And that's, I think, is a technique that's been used against black people, people of color from the beginning, from the very beginning of, from the end of slavery. I mean, it's it, before the end. Of slavery. I mean, if you ever read, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, which is a book in which a very well-educated author lives with very, very poor, the poorest white sharecroppers in Alabama, I think it is. And they say, well, at least we're better than black people. I mean, they're the same. They're, they're not slaves, but they're being treated absolutely horribly. They're practically owned. They'll never get out of debt. They have absolutely nothing to their name. They work from morning till night. Who does that sound like? You know, I mean, there's a, there's a natural alliance, or there should be, but it's it's been purposely divided. And so I try to I try to look at people. I, I see that you are black. I see that other people are women. I have friends who are gay, but I, I try to focus beyond that whenever I possibly can. I don't ignore it. I don't diminish it. But that's not where I put most of my attention. I love that. And I think that's that's what I enjoyed about the it's the class struggle in the book. And you're right, Martin Luther King's last several years of his life, he was focusing on the poor people's campaign. If you remember, we read that book, Why We Can't Wait. That was one of the books we one of the books we read. And 
that was the whole idea. Even Black Panthers trying to get the proletariat from all of the races and backgrounds and 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 creeds to understand that they have more in common than they have different. I'll 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 pause for a second. Anyone else? Meg? Well, I thought the crux of the book was the par paragraph about if a person could really see the moon rise as it is truly without putting a name between the mind and the moon itself, that person would have no armor. Somebody was talking before about how powerful the concept of armor is in the book. That person would have no armor. And here we get towards the part that has to do with where does love come from? It comes from what? Looking at the moon? You're kidding. Okay, that person would have no armor, would not be afraid, could love and let another person love him, and the ground would feel like love and the air um, he breathes. So I think that um, it, it's, it's a very powerful paragraph. Uh, because it says, if we saw the truth uh, of that we're all human beings and that all of the principalities and powers that try to divide us and say, well, we're all human beings, but some people are more human beings than others, because the real basis of the oppression is that the, the people at, at the bottom, whether they're the folks that James Agee was writing about, um, let us now praise famous men, or the other marginalized groups that we we recognize and, and affirm as as God's children and brothers and sisters um the the, the people at the bottom actually by the systemic powers that be are actually considered less human mm -hmm. they're not quite human so you know my the example that always just tears my heart out is there is no way on earth in this country that anybody could have had a political program where they said, if you do X, I will take your children away from you. I will literally, physically come to you, take your children out of your arms. I will not record who you are or who they are, and I will send them somewhere. And I will say that this is a good thing to do because you did X. Well, you are X. And that exactly, Roland. And I can do that because you aren't like us. You aren't people. You aren't people. No one would ever think of doing that to, well, I should, yeah. Um, How could the, the, to those policymakers who made that up, it's like, well, you did why? I'm gonna come and take your children. You, you didn't pay your workers. You ripped the them off. I didn't come and take your kids. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's what this paragraph is about to me. Is like if we truly, truly saw thing, saw the world, the moon, and 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 the people who are under the moon, as we really, really are, without fear, hmm. then we couldn't do this oppressive shit. We just couldn't do it because we would. We would all be in love with the moon and we'd all be in love with the ground and the air. It would be a mystical experience uh, that Merton writes about and Merton experienced himself and, and, and invites everybody to experience. That's the other thing, reason that I thought it was the most important part of the book is it doesn't say to have this spiritual enlightenment, you need to study these particular scriptures and you need to learn Greek or Hebrew or follow the Rinpoche or something. It's just, no, actually, all you have to do is really look at the moon and try, try not to be afraid and see what happens. So I, I think that's radical. I think that's terribly, terribly radical because that's available to everybody. And it includes then not, oh, well, the, the moon looks prettier because I'm spiritually advanced. No, it. It because it's because it makes it possible for me to love you and that I let you love me because you're a real person 
There's mm-hmm. nobody who's not a real person. There's nobody I can take their kids away. Do you remember um, in the Bible where they asked Jesus, what was the most important commandment? Do you remember mm-hmm. what he said? Yeah, love God and love your neighbor. Exactly. In other words, all the other stuff is rules. Try just, <laughs> just loving God, which to me means being grateful for the miracle of life and treat your neighbor the way you would want to be treated, which is very, very hard to do. Very hard to do. It's so simple and, and people, because it's so difficult, focus on every other little thing, who you should sleep with, who you should marry, what you should say for prayers, what you should look like, you know, instead of just saying, try treating other people the way you would want to be treated. It's just so difficult to do that in every minute of life, I think is what Rinpoche tries to do. Every single person he encounters, you know, and some people can accept that and some people aren't ready to accept that, but I think that's what he tries to do. And that auto reminds me so much I, I have three friends right now that if I could get them to read this book, well, every the, since I first read it, I was like, God, this is so-and-so to the point where I almost like name called them auto one day. Cause I just, <laughs> they just remind me so much of, uh, so much of auto. What, what I appreciate is even in, you know, him trying to, to figure it out, trying to get it right. And that little bit of cynicism that, you know, that is always there, he still tries to treat people well. Tries to. Tries to. Tries to treat people well. And so like when when you give that example of when the Bible says, you know, when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, love your neighbor as yourself. And too often, the way that people in our society love themselves more is putting other people down exactly and that it's like that love your neighbor as yourself doesn't mean i have to put you down to love me more it's 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 the exact opposite it's it's i'm opening up myself to not have to be perfect to not have to get it right. And that's why when Otto goes off on those little tirades with the AM radio, with the TV, or when he sees the sign that says, you know, all will have to answer to God's judgment. He's like, how do you know? <laughs> it's that I, I love that because it's like, that's just so much more work yeah. than just being like the Renpoche and living and teaching kindness and, and speaking kindness and that it, it it's changed when i first discovered this book i was on this whole journey of needing more than christianity yeah. and i couldn't even say that if i pastored most churches right it's like oh nope you're a christian pastor you just need jesus and the bible and that's it but i found that these other things buddhism and yoruba and taoism and just ancient wisdoms that don't call themselves religion were so helpful in me loving God and loving my neighbor and loving myself. Like I have to, self has to be in there, but there's a way that we love ourselves, right? That doesn't put more dirt in the glass. I love that uh, moment in the restaurant too, the dirt in the glass and the stirring it up. Um, Any one else i'll say that i loved that too that was that was like a learning moment for me um i've been practicing yoga going on 20 years now but yoga philosophy only seven years um and i i must say that i'm i don't have a consistent meditation practice and but i've thought about since reading that scene, getting some dirt and putting it in a jar and shaking it up and just just meditating on on it settling. Um, I stole that. That's one of the one of the few parts of the book that I borrowed from someone else. Yeah, that was. I, I liked I liked it. I mean, obviously, it made a 
made an impact. I borrowed that and use it in a sermon, but you know, that's what most sermons are, right? Our collections. <laughs> I have to give a sermon this Sunday. I should, I should ask you to help me out. I have to go up to Maine and give a, a sermon, which Look I get asked that. to do. It's a little bit amusing to me because I have no, I have no formal religious background whatsoever, and this might be the fifth time that I've been asked to actually speak from a pulpit, which makes me nervous. I don't envy you. That's a tough job. It makes me nervous every single time I do it. This makes me nervous. Everything makes me nervous. <laughs> well, you have to come up with something every single week. I mean, that's not easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> my, my pastor who trained me, I was like, how do you ever get over the nerves? Cause like when I give speeches, I don't necessarily get nervous. It's like, okay, I know the material. I have to, you know, talking about something, but the sermon thing, I mean, I used to get like nervous to the point where I would be sick. And I would say, how do you, like, when does this go away? And he said, if it ever goes away, that's a problem. Yeah, because that's you're, good. yeah, he's like, cause you're, you're ministering, you're talking to God's people. Like you're representing God. You should be a little nervous. And I was like, you know what? Because nervousness means okay, it's it's not about me. It's you know, it's 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 about the work. So it never goes away. Um, can we go back to the moment with the professor playing miniature golf? Love that moment, and. T to me, that was the that was a, a time that Otto got to exercise some of these skills that he was very new to. So if you remember, that was the point where the Renpoche had asked him not to eat. And this was they were supposed to eat uh, when the Renpoche sees the miniature golf course and like, oh, let's go play. So Otto was ready to eat. He hadn't eaten in a while yet. And so and the red post says, oh, no, we'll we'll play golf first and then we'll eat. So, you know, we get that a little bit of a get that little bit of uh, of a lesson. He encounters the professors, the husband and the wife. The husband's pretty much an ass. Uh, the wife is pretty cool, but this is her husband. So you we find her in this really awkward place that some of us have been in when your friend is showing out or your husband is showing out and you're trying to support them but at the same time like apologizing and the Ren Poche is amazing at golf mm. and, <laughs> and there is a little bet the the asshole wanted to make a bet right that you know if I win this happens if you win that happens, and he has the two hundred dollar putter, and you know Otto and Rinpoche are just using you know what's available, and I thought that was just such a cool moment when Otto said, "So hey, you've played golf before, right?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, in my retreat center, one of the rich guys owns a course, and I play with him all the time." And it just reminded me of how we just never know people's experiences. One of the things we said before you got on Roland was we, we go around and everyone gives us a word that they recommend for the uh, what they thought about the book. And someone said that it just reminded of how you just never know what you can get from people or who you can randomly learn from. When I came to St. Peter's Church, I never thought I would pastor a church that was 60% white that were older than me. When I was called to the church, I was like 27 and I'm sitting around the room being interviewed by all these, you know, 50, 60 year old white people. And I'm like, they're not gonna call me. I'm young, I'm black, I'm gay. Um, <laughs> you know, like there are all these things that it did, they're like, we want you. And I'm like, who? You just never know. And then I form all these friendships like really deep personal relationships with people in the church. And so that just reminded me how you just never know what you can encounter and how like this book club represents showing, like introducing people to stuff that they may not ordinarily be introduced to and how that can just open your mind and open your life to, to things that you really never even knew you needed. 
So I, I really appreciated that. Remember the um, at the very beginning when he goes, uh, Otto, they leave New York City and Otto gets lost. And there's a man sweeping the street in front of a building. That actually yeah. happened. That actually happened. And it was a black man and he was sweeping the street and I pulled over to ask directions and I had the sense that there was that, that he was living in disguise. Mm. That there was that he was kind of at some level pretending to be the guy sweeping the street, but actually there was a lot more going on inside that guy than a guy. And I I try to practice that all the time because I I just have this idea that people people live in disguise. They and I, it's not like they're pretending, it's their spiritual identity is covered over by an identity that we focus on. And mm. you know, my grandmother was this, when I knew her, this old Italian peasant woman who liked to cook and say the rosary every day. And if you looked at her, you know, she was as plain as plain could be. But if you spent three minutes with her, you realize that there was a, there was some other gigantic thing going on with mm. her that gave love out into the world from behind this disguise. And I, I, that is shown to me daily, I would say. Every day I encounter somebody who just, I can just tell this, you can't focus on what, what that rich, poor, whatever they are. It doesn't, you know, that's not the issue. I love that. I love that disguise idea. As you were talking, I was thinking about all the people I know yeah. some people will look at because they have an accent or because they don't dress a certain way or because and will dismiss them. Um, I used to love talking to the custodians on campus when I was a student. Like I would have these long drawn out conversations. My grandfather was a janitor. That was my first job was working for his janitorial service cleaning company. And it's amazing how smart and and with it and how much people knew, but because folks discounted them yeah. as just physical plant or just this, um, I mean, they would tell me, don't take the job with him. He's losing funding. He, he'll, he'll be out of a lab in a couple of months. And it's like, how do you know that? Because people consider them invisible. Um, the proudest, one of the proudest moments of my life, I, I was a scholarship kid at Phillips Exeter Academy, which is a super famous, very ritzy prep school where James Agee went actually and a lot of other famous people. And my older daughter applied to go there and she, you have an, we drove her up there. She had an interview without us in the room. And at the end of the interview, you know how sometimes the interviewer will ask you a little trick question. And it, they were closing up, he was almost standing up and getting ready to leave. And he said, tell me, Alexandra, does your family have any like unspoken rule, you know, that, that, that you know of? And she said, yeah. My dad always told me when someone serves me, look at them and say thank you. When I see someone cleaning the room I'm in, whether it's the maid in the hotel or the janitor in the school, look at them, learn their name if I can and say thank you. And the interviewer was absolutely blown away by that because you know he's used to dealing with a lot of extremely privileged kids. And I was so proud of her to say that. I didn't prep her to say that. It's just that that is a rule in our family. And so, and I think that comes from my dad. He was like that. He could, he, he had friends, literally he was good friends with the governors and the secretary of state and very good friends with city yard workers who didn't finish high school. And he could just travel in all those circles because he just looked at them as full people. Mm. I love that. Anyone else? Can I come to one of your services someday if I'm in, you're in Cincinnati, right? Absolutely. All right, stay in touch with me. I'd like to do that. I drive out sometimes. I have relatives in Indiana. What part of Indiana go? are your relatives? Indianapolis and um, Bloomington and okay. um, Noblesville, my cousins, my mother's sister is mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, Indianapolis is just a couple hours from here. 
well, maybe I'll swing by if you don't mind and just sit there and hear your sermon. Definitely. <laughs> we would love that. Ah, thank you so much, everyone, for reading the book. I do suggest, if you like Breakfast with Buddha, to check out Lunch with Buddha and Dinner with Buddha. I'm um, writing dessert with Buddha. <laughs> I was, and, I, and it's so funny because I always say there is no dessert with Buddha. And now, look at now that. There, is, there will be. Yeah. There thank will you for be. having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, you're very open to to that and I appreciate it. Thank you very much for reading thank, the book also. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And next month's next book is on her own ground. I'm using it right now to prop up my um, um, uh, computer on her own ground. It's the life and times of Madam CJ Walker. It's I was embarrassed because C.J. Walker is a name that I knew just you know from Black history and, and growing up. I was embarrassed about how much I didn't know by, about her, but there's just not a lot. This was written by her great, great granddaughter, Alilia Bundles, who's a journalist and a producer. Um, it's an amazing book. It's a little thicker than we usually read. So I, I encourage people to um, try to get it. If you can't, though, I haven't checked with the library. If they don't have it, we may be able to get copies. I found some online pretty cheap, like some secondhand um, copies. I've already loaned out my extra copy and it is available on Audible. Um, and so if, you, if you're if you an audio listener, you might be able to get the audio copy of the book for the library as well. But super- I have many copies of the Cincinnati Library. Uh, mine came in today. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't have very many copies of yeah, it. Yeah, I didn't think so. Because it, and it's also, it's it came out like twenty years ago. But there's a resurgence because a movie came out based on it a year ago, um, and they even named it Self Made. So this renamed the book. So if you can't find it on her own ground, maybe look up Self Made by Alilia Bundles and. Of course, I'll send out the event rights and all of that. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Roland, Appreciate for it. joining us. And everyone have an awesome day. So, Thank you. Take care. Bless. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.